understanding the voice of God. And we're answering the question tonight, what takes place when God speaks to us? What takes place when God speaks to us? How do we know that he's speaking to us? Last week we studied about it. How do we understand his voice? We need to learn his language, learn what he sounds like. As we studied last week, the story of Samuel and Eli and the voice of God, how Samuel immediately referred to the flesh because he didn't know God. Sometimes we will. And uh, of course, we're studying along with this, Brother Arnold's book, uh, Hearing the Voice of God. And last week, everybody loved my Jeff Arnold interpretation so much that it's back Another week, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but uh, we are going to study this because it's so good and it's just rich and I haven't even dug into half of it yet. We're asking the question, what takes place when God speaks to us tonight? As we look at Acts 11 and 17, For as much then as God gave them the light gift as he did it to us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? This is a good question. Now, would any of us like to stand withstand God here tonight? I know I don't want to. I trust in Him even when, when, when He's doing everything that I understand. I trust in Him when He's not doing things that I understand. I'm not going to withstand God. So, this is the attitude of Paul. When I heard from God, I didn't try to stand in His way. So tonight we're asking the question, what takes place when God speaks to us? And I'm asking Brother James to please pray over this message. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you brought us here safe. We thank you that you brought us here to hear your word. We ask you to open up our ears, that we will open up our ears to hear what you have for us to hear, Lord God, and to be with Pastor Hurst as he speaks your word. Just wrap your Holy Spirit around him, Lord God, that he will speak according to your word, Lord God, and we will receive what you have for us to receive, and we will be healed in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for standing. God bless you. you. May be seated. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So this is an interesting story, a very powerful story, in which Cornelius, a just man, came to know the Lord in a new and fresh way. And he knew the Lord, of course, through the law. He had a, a connection with the Lord through, through the law, even though he was not Jewish. What was he? He was a Roman citizen. Um, and the Bible tells us that he was an Italian. Um, and he was a centurion of the Italian band. Of course, uh, Italy was simply another province in the Roman Empire in those days, and Italy, the word Italy didn't describe the entire boot. It only described, uh, as I understand, the southern part of Italy in those days. Um, we didn't even have a united Italy until the last 120 years or so. So under the Roman Empire, um, he was a very powerful man, and he had his 100 soldiers, hence the name Centuri, Centurion, uh, in uh, this community. And he decided not to be gruff, rough, or tough before the people of the community. He decided to be a giver. He decided to love the people of the community, which means he decided not to be like other Roman soldiers had been. How do we know this? Well, history. We also understand that um, Roman soldiers were violent because somebody told them to stop their violence. Who told them that? John the Baptist said, stop your violence. Incidentally, this church knows Jim Sleeper very well. And in the, in the Calvary play for Easter that I was blessed to be a part of one year, of course, it went on for many, many years. Brother Jim Sleeper was John the Baptist. Can you see it? <laughs> Can you see Jim Sleeper with the camel hair? garment and uh, locusts uh, and wild honey and all of that. So he was a really good, uh, and, and of course, some of the, the, the men of the congregation with the military bearing were Roman soldiers and he got right up in their face and said, stop your violence and be content with your wages. And the, this Roman soldier and centurion decided he was gonna be uh, not like the culture of the Roman army. Bullies, kind of. Um, and so he, he had come to know the people of the community. And we're going to study him tonight. And we're going to study his interaction with God and how it had to do with the voice of God. But before I even get into that, you'll notice how his heart 
was right towards the people of his community. And God sees people's hearts that don't even know him. He sees that. Right. He pays attention to that in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Why, O oh Lord, the prophet said, would you send me to pray for a Syrian captain? Why would you do that? Naaman was his name. Why would you do that? And his slave girl, his Jewish slave girl, said, I know a prophet that can help you with your leprosy. But God chose to look after Naaman because of his heart, even though he wasn't part of the children of Israel. And Jesus did the same for the Syrophoenician woman before the law. And then after the law, the Lord's Spirit was poured out to the Jews first at Jerusalem. But there came a time when the Lord wanted to reach out to all people. So he began going around working through targeted people, specific people in the community. Like, remember, anybody remember when Brother Latta, the different times Brother Latta mm -hmm. came to speak to us? Yes. And uh, he, he wrote a book many years ago called Box 44 Monrovia. And he wrote a book right the couple of years before he died called He is Black and Blue, But He is Not Through. And he's talking about being a missionary to Liberia, a country that was founded by Thomas Jefferson, and, or James Madison, and it was Thomas Jefferson's brainchild, but James Madison founded it in Africa uh, with the idea that uh, slaves would be free and be able to go back to Africa. God sent Brother and Sister Latta there, and they had no idea what to do. So they went to Monrovia, and uh, during the process of time, as they reached the community, he did get beat up. He did get left for dead on the street, and he was black and blue. And But he told me, and he told the church, he said, not knowing what to do in the 1960s in a foreign country, I just prayed, and the Lord led me to targeted people. The Lord would lead me across the pathway of people. And so that as I cast my seed, I was able to cast it into fertile soil. And so this is how the Lord was working here. Uh, as, and I wanted to kind of just build a little foundation. Uh, we're going to look at the book of Acts and uh, beginning with Acts chapter 10. And we're going to go through the whole chapter pretty much, verses 1 through 48. Acts chapter 10 and verse 1. There was a man, a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. Uh, of course, Caesarea was a city that was artificially built over the water. And if you want to see it, you can just go south of Joppa, which is Jaffa today, or which is a twin city with Tel Aviv, which we call Tel Aviv. And so if you want to go south of there on the Mediterranean Sea, you will see how the Romans, brilliant engineers without computers, built a city out over the water. And the stones are still there, the massive limestone blocks that they had hauled in uh, and the water system whereby they gave water to the city. So this city was actually built on the beach and on the water. Um, and so his name was Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, not having the Holy Ghost, not having the revelation of, of Jesus Christ, but he was still devout uh, and one that feared God with all his house. He gave much, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. So he gave alms to the people, uh, which means he gave money to the people that were in need. Uh, he prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him. We know according to the scripture how uh, the Bible tells us that when the Bible says the angel, the Bible explains to us an angel of God is an angel. And the angel of the Lord or an angel of the Lord, is described as a theophany, which means it's God himself in the form of an angel. So this was just an angel, not God, uh, coming into him and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And so this is God speaking to him through a messenger of an angel. And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. In other words, we're trying to figure out how to hear and understand the voice of God. This is a situation where someone who did not know God's language had not received God's holy language, speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance, did not know about Jesus Christ, except, of course, he would have heard about him, but did not fully believe in him. But he's speaking, and because of his heart, the translation is made into the Holy Ghost for God to hear his prayer. The Bible tells us, God doesn't hear the prayer of the sinner 
unless he chooses to hear the prayer of the sinner. He hears prayers of people that are not right with him. If they pray in repentance, he always hears it. But some people that are not right with God will ask prayer requests of him, and he has the right to choose to dismiss that prayer or receive that prayer. I can remember a story of Sister Glenda Childress uh, from our church in Missouri. She was originally from Modesto, California, by the Randy Keys Church, now by the Todd Johnson's Church, and uh, she was not living for God, and one of her children was in trouble. And she told the Lord, Lord, I know you don't, I'm not living right, and I know you don't have to hear my prayer, but I'm asking for your grace and mercy for my, I think it was for Gary, her son, who was getting in trouble, Gary Jr. And uh, she went to the Lord like that, understanding. So you see, here the situation is, Cornelius doesn't have, he doesn't understand uh, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name and the Holy Ghost, but God is receiving his prayer. And his prayers and his alms. So the money he had given to the community to help them and his prayers had come up for a memorial before God. So remember, hearing and understanding the voice of God necessarily means speaking to him. So what takes place when God speaks to us? We talk to him and then he speaks to us and then we talk to him back. I know it's deep. It's complicated. But it's called a conversation. And it's how human beings converse. And I have met, I've never met one person that is a, an exception to this rule. People will say, and, and I, I can say this because I've gotten, I, about 10, 15 years ago, I got to a point in my life where I had kind of absorbed by, by growing up a whole lot of all of the different personality types. So I've got a little bit of an introvert in me. I like being alone. I've never met an introvert that didn't have a friend group that they would chatter like a little bird to. They just didn't like to talk to everybody. So there are people that will say, I don't really do well at talking, so I don't really do well at praying, so how am I ever going to speak to God or hear the voice of God? I never met anybody that didn't have some group of people or at least one person that when they got around them, there was, you know, like, like a bunch of turkeys. Just, just yak, 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 yak. But when right, they get around right. certain people they don't want to talk to, then the introvert comes in. So there's no excuse for anybody being an introvert with God. You ought to be comfortable talking to God. If Cornelius, a Roman centurion, it's a stretch to call him anything other than somebody who didn't fully know God, but he had connected with God through the Jewish law and connected with his community through his understanding of the Jewish law. He had an understanding of God from an Old Testament point of view because that's all he'd ever been given. If he was able to talk to God, then we can talk to God. Anybody can talk to God in his language. Anybody can have a conversation with God. If you can have a conversation with someone in, uh, in the flesh, a real human being, then you can have a conversation with God. So I love the fact that this came up as a memorial before God. What happens? When, what takes place when God speaks to us? He speaks to us and we speak back to Him. We listen to Him is what takes place. If we are not listening to Him, then He is not able to get anything across to us. We learned this last week by reading what Brother Arnold said. God is always talking. We're just not always listening. Sometimes God is talking and we don't like what He is saying. And so we shut Him off. Now, that is, it's entirely possible. It's called selective hearing. And it is within every human being to have selective hearing. I didn't hear that. As a pastor, I've developed an almost supernatural ability to know when people are not listening to me. <laughs> and that just comes from, that's not really the Holy Ghost. Uh, that is a learned behavior that comes from public speaking. You know when you've lost your audience. I went to uh, a convention where I was to give a speech in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I, I was up there to compete for public speaking. And I, I don't know, I, don't, I think I might have got third place, but um, it was like a thousand kids and I had to get up in front of them and speak. And the girl that went before me, I know who she was because her name was Ashley Crawford and she went to another school and I was in love. <laughs> and uh, she, she got up there and she cracked an egg and dropped it into a glass 
and did like that and said, there, now that I have your attention. And she spoke for three minutes. And it was good. She got everybody's attention. And so what takes place when God speaks to us? If, in fact, God is speaking to us and we are listening, let me add that caveat, then we're speaking back to him. He is speaking in response to us or he's speaking in response to something he wants to do. He wants to hear what we are saying, but he needs our attention. God is gaining our attention. The Bible says God's attention was gained by Cornelius because his prayers and his alms got God's attention. A memorial before God. That is not the first time. It's not the first time in Scripture the Bible says that God stores prayers. We know that the prayers of the saints are poured out upon the earth for judgment and for uh, the outpouring of God's power and his authority and the fulfillment of prophecy in the book of Revelation. So God does store our prayers. And there is a connection between us and God when God is speaking to us. So the first thing I want to show you tonight is that when what takes place when God speaks to us, a conversation is taking place. We need to get it out of the mystical, okay? And I know that there are some times when the Holy Ghost is moving and there's chill bumps and the power of God feels mystical and there ain't a thing in the world wrong with that, okay? But we need to understand that it's not mysticism and that there are also those times when there is an ordinary, average, still small voice of God that does not have always the glamour and we discussed that last week. So uh, Cornelius in verse 5, and now this is what I want you to do. You talked to God. You didn't really know who you were talking to, but God listened. And you did good deeds because your heart was right. So now this is what I want you to do. When God speaks to us, what else happened? God gives direction. A conversation take play, takes place, which means we speak and he speaks. And then God gives direction. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon whose surname is Peter. He lodges with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Now, let me tell you, friend, you don't want to go to a, you, you don't want to go to a tanner's house in ancient times because you know what they used to tan leather with? Anybody know? I don't know. It comes from, it comes from a dog. <laughs> That's what the, the majority of cultures use to tan leather. And... Uh, there are there are other means, but the majority of cultures, uh, and, and in fact, there are places in Kathmandu where you can smell that, uh, and there are entire cities in India that smell like that because there you can use much more modern chemicals. So so uh, Simon Peter um, had to live at that kind of house. So when God tells you to do something, it might not necessarily be something. Would you want to go to a house with somebody who's using dog excrement out in the backyard? To tan leather. Uh, uh, by the way, tanner doesn't mean that he owned tanning boots, tanning beds. It didn't mean that he sprayed people to turn them orange. So just so we're clear, we're speaking the same language. He's by the seaside, and he will tell you what you ought to do. What happens when God speaks to us? We have a conversation. What happens when God speaks to us? He gives us direction. But... God doesn't always give us all the direction at the same time. And oftentimes, more often than not, he wants us to connect with somebody else so that that person can give us direction through God. God works through people. And he forces it so. He will not be pushed around. He will not be bullied. He will not allow the... the way that we want it to be, which is always the humanity, the flesh always wants it the easy way. God wants it to come about in a way that teaches us something. God is always about the business of teaching us things. And so he wants, and he did this for the highest prophets that I would consider, you know, I would not consider myself similar to Elijah, but God taught Elijah a lesson when he told him to stop whining and crying about Jezebel. God does things and speaks to us in a way that will cause us to learn and more often than not, he sends us to somebody who will speak to us and give us... He said, so this is the question that the flesh says. Why didn't God just tell Cornelius what to do? This is a very good question. And I will answer it. I've already answered it. Because God wanted Cornelius to connect with Simon Peter. He wanted the church to grow and all the good things that would come through that connection. And he wanted Peter to preach because God didn't cause angels to go and preach the message. He caused preachers to go and preach the message. Yes. And that is why 
the word for angels and preachers is basically the same at, past, at pastors and angels is basically the same and it's actually translated as angels in Revelation but what it means is pastors and it infers of course that pastors have a special angel and so the pastor was the messenger in this case Peter the apostle was the messenger so God has a plan when he speaks to us what, happened, what takes place when God speaks to us let's continue and when the angel was spoken to Cornelius was departed he obeyed, okay? He called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto him, he sent them to Joppa. And so this is a centurion. God didn't tell him to go to Joppa. He said, send your men to Joppa. And Jesus had a, a interaction with a centurion one time. And the centurion said, I'm like you. You've got angels that you send about and I've got men that I send about. And so the centurion was dealt with by the angel of God to go send his men, and he obeyed. What happens when God speaks? Of course, I continue to add the caveat. What happens, what takes place when God speaks when we, when we have a good conversation with him? Now, there are bad conversations, and there are conversations where nothing gets done, and someone slams the door, and, and there's frustration. Obviously, when I'm saying that when God speaks to us, this is what happens when we have a good conversation with him. And so on the morrow, verse 9, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, and he became very hungry and would have eaten. But some of you are there right now. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending on him, as it had been a great sheet, knit the four corners and let down to the earth. Sounds like a magic carpet and wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. Well, he was hungry. This is a wild dream. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. So this is a not a dream, it's a vision, of course. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that was common or unclean. So Peter recognized that God was speaking and that it, it was this voice. And Peter told God no. And he had a good reason to say no. And he wasn't sassing God. He wasn't back-talking God. Because God told Ezekiel, I want you to bake bread with dung. And Ezekiel said, no, Lord, I've never let anything cross my lips that is common or unclean. And the Lord said, see, I have given you cow's dung for man's dung. It's, it's, not, a really good, it's not really good, is it? It doesn't make you feel any better. Okay? I would not rather, I would rather not eat either one. And I would not have bread that way. But Ezekiel did say no to the Lord. And Peter said no to the Lord. And he didn't say it with a bad attitude. He said, I've always followed the law. I've always obeyed the law since I was a young man. I've never eaten bats. I've never eaten snakes. I've never eaten lizards. And if it didn't divide the hoof and chew the cud or blah, blah, and all of that with the law, and I, I didn't eat the rabbit, and the fish made sure it wasn't a catfish. I ate a fish with scales, etc., etc. And so you can talk to God. You can have a conversation with Him. God is not having a conversation with you to strike you with lightning. And the only time that you can't have that conversation real quick is when you're in the move of the Holy Ghost and you're in the altar and God is telling you to go pray for some pray with somebody. And there will be other times, maybe not in the church service, but there are some occasions when you don't need to backtalk God, and you don't ever need to backtalk God, but there's times when you don't need to speak for yourself. You just need to do it. When God tells you to do something, the Holy Ghost is moving, you go pray for that person. You don't say, no, Lord, I've never done this. But most of the time, when God is speaking to you, there is room for a little play for you to explain it to Him. If you do it in a right spirit, as I have said many times, it's not wrong to ask God questions. But it's wrong to question God. Right. The spirit with which you take it before the parent uh, is the same spirit, the spirit that you would want to take it before your, your heavenly father. <coughs> Peter said, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Sometimes God corrects us when he speaks. What takes place when God speaks? Sometimes He corrects us. We should receive His correction. We should receive His correction because He is a good father. And a good parent will correct their child. Don't touch the stove. 
Not because I don't want you to eat, but because I said so. <laughs> and because the stove is hot, you're going to burn your hand. So I want you to not call common or unclean the lizard, bat, snake, whatever that God has cleansed. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, was lodged there. What takes place when God speaks? The unknown will sometimes be what God speaks to you. This will take place sometimes when God speaks. Sometimes God will speak to you things that you do not understand. It, do not buy a book about interpreting the voice of God in a dream, wherein the book teaches you, uh, if you see this person in the dream, it always means this. If you see this animal in the dream, it always means this. If you have one at home, throw it away, because that is meddling with divination and witchcraft. That is not ever how the Bible teaches that God interprets visions or dreams to his people. Because we have Joseph and we have Daniel, which both went and prayed and got the interpretation of a dream. Peter did not try to say, okay, I'm going to go out to the Greek market here where the Greeks get their food and I'm going to just eat a raw lizard right now. <laughs> he didn't say that. Because he was doubting within himself what the dream meant. Which means he was thinking about it. Yes. God's going, what takes place when God speaks to you, he is sometimes going to give you something to chew on. And you've got that cud in your mouth, and you're chewing on it over and over again just like a cow. Trying to figure out what is going on. Do not be upset if God speaks something to you, and you have to mull it over in your mind. Right. That... I cannot tell you the number of times that God has given me a word for the church that wasn't a sermon, or a word for the church that was supposed to be a sermon or a lesson, but it was years before I understood how to build that into a lesson or a sermon, or something I was supposed to tell somebody. Because we don't always understand everything. And there's some things we are not going to understand. I believe the old hymn will understand it better by and by. I believe that. I believe there's some things we need to understand now and now. But there's some things we will accept that we will understand better by and by. So Simon is thinking about this, and you need to think about the voice of God. You should write down things that God says to you. You should text them to yourself. You should keep a note. You should put, put a file in, on your computer. You should write it in your notebook. Things that God tells you. Everybody should have a prayer journal. Uh, verse 19, while Peter was thinking on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, get thee down, and go answer the door, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius, and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. So the Holy Ghost is speaking to him about what he needs to do. Still doesn't have the answer necessarily to everything in the vision, but uh, he is obeying the Lord. So tell me why you've come. Verse 22. And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nations of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house, and to hear words of thee. Then he called them in, and lodged them, let them spend the night, and on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. Do you see what's happening? <laughs> Something has taken place, and there's about to be a revival in Caesarea because he's called his kinsmen and near friends. God spoke to me. So let's just have this a gathering of the faithful. We're going to hear something from this guy. This would not have happened necessarily if God had just said, this is what you've got to do. But God said, I want you to go find the preacher, and then he will tell you what to do. So go one town away to Joppa. And send your men and bring him here. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. So you see, Cornelius didn't understand the fullness of the truth. So he, being a heathen by birth, fell down and worshipped this guy. Because he's now the visible manifestation of the holy dude in glowing garment that came to him 
as he was in his house, the angel. And he's thinking, wow, this guy is a god. This is Jupiter come down, you know. So Peter took him up saying, stand up, I myself also am a man. And he talked with him and he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, you know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come into one of another nation. But God, you see, something happened along the way, and when he got into this Greek man's house, this man of Greek culture, Italian man's house, something hit him like a bolt of light, and the revelation came. Neither one of these guys that had both had conversations, one with God through the angel, one with the Lord not manifesting except himself, but all of it just a voice from the heavens, neither one of these guys understood what God was saying to them. One had a relationship with God. One did not have a relationship with God. One understood what was going to happen but uh, in the going to get Peter, but he didn't understand what was going to happen after that. Peter did not understand the fullness of the dream. But something happened, and he began to realize it was not about lizards and snakes and unclean animals. It was about people. God has told me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gain, saying, as soon as I was sent for, because God told me and I obeyed, I ask therefore for what intent have you sent me? You see, what happens when God speaks? When the people that are involved obey, God will have his way. What happens when God speaks? God has his way. <clears throat> Excuse me, verse 30. And Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon and Tanner by the seaside. When he cometh, he shall speak to thee. Immediately therefore I sent unto thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Would to God that everybody was ready to receive the word of God that way. Amen? Yes. So Peter preached, and I'm not going to get into it because my time is nearing an end tonight, but uh, if I, I might just teach from the next page uh, next week. But a very powerful thing came, took place because when God spoke, there was a conversation that took place. Cornelius, who didn't know God, and Peter, who knew God and had walked with Jesus God manifested in flesh. Both had conversations. They both obeyed God. They both listened to what he had to say. Neither of them understood the fullness of what God had to say. They understood the language, but you know there's a difference between understanding and comprehension if you've ever been on the phone with a customer service agent that was not based in the United States. The English is so good. The English is very good. I am going to read to you your checking account statement because I speak very good English. But the comprehension is not there. They have no idea what you're talking about because they can speak English but can't comprehend English. You understand the difference between hearing what someone has to say and listening to what someone has to say. Hearing what someone has to say and receiving what someone has to say. And so when we hear it, when we receive it, the conversation is a positive conversation. It bears fruit, and God has his way. Now, in, in closing, five minutes. Can you, can you give me five minutes of Jeff Arnold? It's good. It's good. It's good. Hebrews chapter 3, wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice. That's the issue. It's not that he isn't talking, it's that we're not willing. I don't know if the Lord made his around, made his way around Joppa and Caesarea looking for other people. It's entirely possible that there could have been many young women and many carpenters before Joseph and Mary. I don't know, there could have been another Jeremiah. I do know that there were many failed prophets. I know that there was one prophet Lions meet laying on the side of the road because he didn't obey God. All the heroes of the faith are joined in history by failures of the faith. 
Some people are listening and some people are not. Some people are willing and some people are not. He said, if you will hear. There's no, you know what? The willingness is the difference between Peter and Judas. Both betrayed Jesus. One of them, it was more malicious. But there's some evidence that he didn't know exactly what he was doing because he went and threw the silver and got upset because of where it was going. Both of them could have killed themselves. One found repentance and preached Pentecost. One took his own life. Willingness. He said, if you will hear. Brother Arnold says, I'm talking, but you make the decision whether you will hear. So our hearing flows out of our willingness. Isn't that good? Our hearing flows out of our willingness. Now this may surprise you, but there are lots of believers who don't want to hear the voice of God. Let me explain. We advertise a healing crusade that we're going to pray for the sick, those that are handicapped, etc. People will pack the building. This is because people would love to hear from God when He is blessing and healing those who are sick and afflicted or giving them what they ask for. Amen? We all like that. Okay, nothing wrong with that. But the people of the world are that way too. But if the spirit of revelation and prophecy begins working in the speaker and he begins to deal with people about secret sins, I want to get up out of my wheelchair, but I don't want to give up my addiction. You see the difference? Secret faults and things with, about which they need to repent, he'll empty the house in 10 minutes. Oh, I thought this was a healing crusade. I didn't know it was a repentance crusade. And I've been, I've been to a big healing crusade and there was a lot of unbelief in the room. I'll tell you that right now. That is because people want to hear from God when he's going to bless them and fix them, but they don't want to hear from God when he's going to correct them and deliver them. He says uh, in John 6, the people are following Jesus because he's healing people and they're following him because he gave them loaves and fishes. And that is directly stated in the Bible. They followed him because of the loaves and fishes. Okay? But when he starts talking about doctrine and personal discipline by saying, it's more than loaves and fishes, but he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life in him. Boom, all the crowds left him. They got offended at his saying. I think that's the scripture where it says many people were offended. It's a difficult saying. What is he talking about? Eat my flesh and drink. I don't understand that. I don't want to hear this business. I liked it when he was just healing me. I liked it when he was just uh, you know, handing out loaves and fishes. Everybody left, and the twelve disciples remained. What happened? Jesus was talking, but he was not saying what they want to hear. In our case, Jesus is calling us into personal responsibility. I don't want to be responsible for anything. I just want to be a welfare saint. You understand? This is important. Okay? And we know that there are people that receive the help of the government that need the help of the government. And God bless it for doing that. Although it's my money that's doing it, so hey, whatever. But there are a lot of people out there that are able-bodied that just want to check. That's not the way we're supposed to live for the Lord. I just gimme, 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 gimme. We need to be like Leah, okay? Leah was gimme, gimme, gimme. Three boys. One boy, another boy, another boy. Me, me, me. But then she had her fourth child all of a sudden, boom. Now I will praise the Lord. We need to be like Leah. We need to praise the Lord no matter what. We need to love Him. We don't need to be welfare saints. We need to be saints that say, Lord Jesus, I'm, I know that you saved me, but I'm going to do everything I can to bless you and to give my life to you and to pour myself into your kingdom and I'm going to listen to you when you bless me and I'm going to listen to you when you correct me. I will hear the voice of God. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Okay? As in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation. And I close with this. Why was God grieved with that generation? Because they saw his works and they heard his voice and they hardened their hearts because they didn't like what he was saying. And they, they began to say slavery was better because we had cucumbers and leeks and onions. What foolishness. What foolishness. They were free in the desert and they had angels food to eat and yet they murmured because they didn't like what God gave to them. 
we need to make sure that we are accepting what God says to us, even if we don't understand it, Cornelius. Even if we don't understand it, of all the people that should have understood the word of God immediately and that vision should have been Simon Peter. But he did not get mad. He just mulled it over in his mind. God wants to talk to you. He wants to talk to me. He does not just want to talk to the pastor or the ministers of the church. He wants to talk to everybody. God began talking yeah, to me crazy. when I was about seven years old. And I never, ever stopped believing that I could do anything that God empowered me to do. I never stopped believing that. I've always believed that I could do anything that God accomplished. And that's how I've gotten myself in all kinds of trouble. Because I believe, I just am crazy enough to believe what God tells me. I never lost my idealism that I got at 1992 Mississippi Senior Camp and 1992 Louisiana Camp Meeting. I never lost it and I'm never going to lose it because I've seen God do amazing things. And God gets me out on a limb sometimes and he always comes and helps me, Brother James. Because I believe him. I don't understand him all the time, but he always comes along and explains himself, well, most of the time. But I'm okay with that. I'm okay that someday in this life or in the life to come, he's going to explain some things. I'm okay with that because you know what? I am not God. And I don't want that kind of responsibility because I'd go around killing everybody. <laughs> I don't want to be God. I love you folks. Why don't we just praise the Lord? Thank you, Jesus, for your word. I give you praise and glory. You are so good.